everyone and welcome to another wonderful episode of Paranormal Minds. I hope all of you had an amazing Thanksgiving. I know I did and we are back to the grind this week and getting ready for Christmas. I know sure some of you, most of us are. Some of us are like Grinches and like, no, not yet. Um, tonight I have on Karen A. Dahlman, and Karen believes that self-empowerment is the key to living a richly rewarding and authentic life. All of her education, life and career experiences, and the companies she's developed and owned center around the theme of living a bountiful life through creatively pushing boundaries and expressing inner potentials. Um, Karen received her BA and MA degrees from the University of New Mexico. She began her professional career as an art psychotherapist, licensed counselor, hypnotherapist, and artist back in 1989. From Karen's background and practice as a licensed and board certified art psychotherapist and hypnotherapist, she invites you to tap into and unleash your own unique forms of creativity in one book and in the other book. Evolve beyond the stereotypical societal beliefs about what happens when we are dead and learn to communicate with the deceased and <clears throat> spirits. Currently, Karen continues to creatively diversify her interest within new frontiers and challenges herself to express further potentials via her understandings and practices of what she writes about. Um, this is Karen's keystone to living an abundant life. And without further ado, I want to go ahead and welcome in Miss Karen to Paranormal Minds. How are you doing, Miss Karen? Hi, Shannon. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great this evening. How are you? I am hanging in there for sure. <laughs> right. Um, I did want to go ahead and take a moment to thank you so much for the book you sent me. Oh, you're so welcome. The Spirits so of welcome. Luigi. It was, I, I know I told you last night it was an awesome book, but it really is. And, and then I went into further detail, but you know, it, it is, it's a really, it's an amazing book. I love your perspective. I love when people have a different perspective on something mainstream. Um, and I just, I think it's absolutely amazing. And you signed it for me, which is double amazing. You're very welcome. <laughs> Happy to do that. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be on your show and do uh, be a part of your of your audience base and what you guys do. It's it's. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. And um and I I, I want to go ahead and just kind of talk about you first before we get into spirits of Ouija and um, the spirit of creativity. Um, I kind of want to talk about you. Um, what kind of started your journey in the paranormal field? I know it's not for most people something they wake up and go, hey, I'm just going to do this one day. <laughs> Right. Some people do, though. I guess they watch TV shows. But, you know, for me, it was more about I, I had always had paranormal experiences as a very young child, not always knowing even how to place and understand what was happening. I mean, I always thought everybody saw colors around people. I didn't realize people, people didn't always see auras. I thought that was a normal thing. I, I thought it was normal to have a friend that I'd play with that nobody else could see. I, I thought it was normal if, if I if, if I guess you could call them ghost came to me. It was just something that I always, always had happened when I tried to explain to people, um, my family, parents, friends, it was a little kooky to them. So I kind of learned to keep some things to myself, but I started studying. I started reading at a very young age. I remember going to my elementary library and checking out every single book I could that I could find on ghosts, paranormal activity, poltergeists, aliens, UFOs, angels, anything I could find. And, I was amazed and actually impressed at how many books were in my um, library and a couple different schools I'd, I'd gone to during my um, younger younger years when I was reading about this stuff. But I was amazed that they didn't have these books like this in a children's library. It was great. So that's what happened. I was trying to really understand what was going on in my life and, and just to make sense of it. And, you know, it's the making sense of it part sometimes that can be a little bit tricky. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You don't know why, what, how, what is this? I was just thinking things were normal until I was told I shouldn't be talking to somebody that they can't see. <laughs> you know, but that was just, I, I just thought I could play with this little person. Um, you know, so, so that was really the beginning of it all for me. And then, and then when I was about the age of um, eight, it was when I was eight, um, I had some friends down the street who had a Ouija board. And so the story goes, that's when I started using the board and, and had great response with it. The, the board has always worked for me. And it worked for those gals that were using it. They were both sisters. And immediately we spoke to one of their dead sisters. One of the girls had a twin that was dead. I, I never knew that. They never shared that with me. Um, 
it was just amazing to me. And I said, why would you not tell me? He said, we just don't like to talk about it. But their, their dead sister came through and was, it would talk to them on the board and spoke to me. And, I, and that, to me, that was just flabbergasting. That was just amazing. That was incredible. I mean, I think the whole world should know how, how awesome this was, you know, but that's not what other people thought. They thought that this was kind of stupid, silly in the game. Um, but I didn't, and I kept, I kept with it. And, and throughout the years, I've always spoken to um, deceased as well as um, guardians and angels and other entities that are, are consciousness that are beyond which is something um, we're going to dig into more in just a moment. Um, so when and why did you decide to make the transition to an author? How did that path kind of come about? Well, um, very interesting that you're asking me that because when I wrote my first book, and I have it right here, um, The Spirit of Creativity, when I wrote this book, I actually wrote it um, about 18 years ago. And I wrote it when I was a therapist. So I, I was doing a, a lot of work as a therapist teaching training, um, doing things such as um, workshops, public workshops, and people always wanted to know a little bit more. So I used to make tapes. I did, back then it was cassette tapes. <laughs> we would do tapes and, and I'd have um, visualizations and meditations they could follow along and start getting, tapping into their creativity, tapping into these resources that are, that are deep within ourselves that really need to be expressed. So I wrote this book, uh, the first one I just showed you about 18 years ago, and I put it away. Things had changed in my life. I went through a major life change, upheaval, I would say. That's a nice way of putting it. But it was a good thing. Life changes, and we change with it. And when that happened, I put the manuscript away. I was approaching you know, quite a few different um, publishing houses. But I put it away, and I decided to switch careers. I wanted a whole life makeover. And then I, I moved to California and got involved in telecommunications and then started my company down, down in California, where I am now. Um, the book has always been really important to me and, and all the work I've done with the, with the spirits, with, with my um, Ouija board, with my explorations into, the, into other realms and consciousness. So it was something that I was always doing uh, reading, um, journaling, educating myself more, speaking to the spirits, that I decided when it got to a point with my company that it was okay for me to come out in the public and start talking about these things. And the first book, I brought the first book out, published it a year ago in November, November 2012, and had a great success with it. But what I found was people were really interested in the story behind the book. And uh, you may know a little bit of the story, Shannon, when, when you read My Spirits of Ouija, I mentioned it in one little part in the book. But the story behind that first book is that I was consulting the Ouija as I wrote the book. And I would ask it for, you know, let's, let's, I would say, what are some good topics to talk about? And of course, they were based on my work as a therapist. But the Ouija would say, well, let's explore this concept. I'm, I'm going to give you a topic such as dualism. And now I want you to go write about it. And I'd write about it, and, and it was my own information coming out, but I'd go back to them in a couple weeks, check in, they'd say, let's see how, you, how you've done. And we'd, we'd talk about it, and they say, you need to go deeper, or have you thought about this concept? And then I'd add it, and, I, and so I just, they were like my, my guides, my editors, my colleagues as I wrote these books, and, or the first book, excuse me, and, and the second book too, but the first book mainly I'm talking about. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to mention them in the book. They told me not to mention their names in the book and not to mention anything about Ouija. But when I started sharing my book out in the public, doing book signings as well as radio and shows, people wanted to understand why and how I wrote the book. And so the whole idea of my work with Ouija was out in the open now. And that's when I got a lot of push and from, from people listening to, to the shows and interacting with me, really wanted to hear about my Ouija stories. So that's why the second book, Spirits of Ouija, came out because I wanted people to really understand what was been going on all my life behind the writing of the first book, but all my life behind everything I've been doing. And that um, it was such a, it was so important for me to share with people. So my beliefs, but a lot of the beliefs that came from them on the other side, or let me back up. I really not say other side, although I use that term a lot. It, to me, it's more of a multidimensional realm that we're all existing in mm -hmm. and they exist with us. They're just at a different vibration, a different, a different frequency. And so it was really important for me to let everybody know that, that the world is just so large and so huge. And there's so many possibilities out there for us if we just open up and explore them. So my first book really takes you back into yourself and how to do that within yourself. The second book is more about how to use 
other guidances around you, other helpers around you to do that as well. But always, it's always about going back within and finding your own answers. Um, let's go ahead and start talking about um, your book, The Spirits of Ouija. Now, you say Ouija. Am I yes. mispronouncing or is there some kind of terminology there I should know about? It's actually Ouija. That's, a, that's the actual correct way of saying it. People say Ouija. And once in a while, I'll say that too. I'll slip around and just play around and say, I'm playing, I'm doing my Ouija board. But it's Ouija. <laughs> Ouija is the correct way of, of pronouncing it. Ouija. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try tonight to do the correct way. And when <laughs> I don't do it, don't hold me back I know, points or anything. And, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's tongue in cheeks, so that's fine. We, we're all saying this, we all are talking about the same device. It's all okay. right, so many people within the paranormal field would disagree with you about using this object, the Ouija board, okay? So what would you have to say to a person that says this is bad mojo stuff like you don't mess with this what would your yeah, response be it, it's good that's a great question a great way to start out um and it's not just paranormal field it's i get that from a lot of people uh, apparently obviously because um people do think it's bad mojo you know i've had nothing but good experience on board i've had some that are just you know a little different but nothing that's been bad that's that i've heard some horrific stuff that people have, have encountered I haven't had that, but I've always used the board differently. And so when, when I hear that from people, I would say, well, what were the circumstances in which you used the board? And I would also ask them, what was your mind? What was your, your mind intent? What was your focus? Um, were you imbibing in substances? <laughs> you know, were you drinking? Were you playing around? Was it, was it used in, 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 in jest? Uh, um, and typically, yes, it'll be yes to one of those questions. And it, it was not a seriousness because, you know, it's packaged as a game. So who would know to use it in a, in a serious manner as I speak about in my books? But, well, I've learned through trial and error, Shannon. It wasn't like I just came out of the box doing this right. Um, I was very intrigued by it, that it could work, that I knew I would approach it more seriously. But yet I tried all those things I mentioned don't do. Um, so I say it's a great tool if you know how to use it, as any other tool is. And when, when I say know how to use it, use it in a manner that's going to allow you to speak to entities who want to help you, who um, have clarity and guidance, but not necessarily give you the answers, don't tell you what to do. I mean, you, you, you have a mind of your own and a heart of your own, and the whole idea is to use it just as, a, as an adjunct to your own life. And so to me, it's a positive tool to use. And, and I have been to hauntings where I've used to haunted houses and poltergeist activities where I've used it to communicate, and it's, it's worked out very well for me. But then again, I've been using it for many, many years, and my level of, of being able to open the portal and close it works very well for me, and for the spirits to come through, it works very well. So it, it's been, it, I say it's a good tool to use. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and talk about um, the Ouija board um, in general. Um, I know in your book you have a whole chapter dedicated to the history of the board, um, but can you take a brief moment just to break it down? Because it always has not been known as the Ouija board, and I know that it's changed throughout time as well. So can you just take a moment to touch on that? Yeah, I guess I can. So it was in 1890 when they filed a patent on the Ouija or Egyptian luck board. There was two names they filed it under, um, Ouija or Egyptian luck board. And they got the patent granted to them in 1891. However, in my book, as Shannon's mentioning, I do talk about some other devices that were used that were very similar looking to what the modern day Ouija board looks like. And I, I have a few here, of course. Um, this is the one I always use. This is the one that, that I got when I was eight years old from Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Great Christmas gifts, what I wanted. And then here's a, here's a board that's like, you're referring to a, like the radio talking board. This one is um, Swami made by the company. I think it's Gift Giftcraft. Yeah, Giftcraft. And that's about a 1940s board. Here's one that's about 1920s. And this is the mystifying oracle made by, by the Ouija company. Um, but let me tell you, so, so they, they had some devices out there where they had alphabet cards is, is one, where the psychic would put her finger down and touch and knew where to stop touching by how she felt. It was more of an internal psychic thing. Then, the, then there was um, the witch board, which supposedly President Grover received as a gift, a wedding gift one year when we got married and he, he they know he received it because he wrote a thank you letter back to the company that sent it to him so that was before that was that was before um 1890 in 1891 but what happened was when 
the comp a bond is the name Elijah Bond filed the patent. He was a, he was an attorney himself. When he filed it, it immediately went to the hands of Charles Kennard, and they started the Charles Kennard Novelty Company. And there was a group of gentlemen involved in that company. And all this is in my book, and, and I'll just go over it quickly. But what happened was they eventually broke it down to two people that ended up owning the company. And William Fold was one of them. And um, actually two of them, and they gave William Fold the rights eventually when the men sold off their, their portions of the company. So that, that William Fold it took on Ouija board and just really made it the, the, who it, what it is today. And then many other talking boards came out after that with various names, as I showed you one, the Swami boards one. Um, I have a collection of only 10, but Robert Murch, who's a, who's a historian and on the subject of Ouija, has over 500 boards now, uh, talking boards and Ouija boards. But the Ouija board it really became quite popular in the United States in around the 20s, 30s, 40s. It was in almost every household. And that's because of the war. People wanted to talk to their loved ones they lost in, in the war's carnage. Um, those were hard times. And so they were able to um, communicate in a lot more expedient manner. Before that, they were doing a lot of table tipping. They were doing the alphabet cards. They were doing seances. They were doing the knocks, the raps on the walls. They, they were doing the, the planchette, which is the automatic writer, which looks like a Ouija planchette. So I said Ouija right there. <laughs> Ouija <laughs> planchette caught me. <laughs> but it moves around with these little wheels on it. And it would, it would actually write. It had an aperture for a pencil and it would write. That was what they retrofitted and made it into the planchette we know today. So that's kind of a real brief history, um, but but it was a very popular tool, a very popular parlor game. They called it a, they considered it a game, although people believed it worked. Hmm. Now, as far as you know, it, I know like some of the boards are marketed like in a Hasbro game box, mm -hmm. and you know that that's how they're marketed. Is there? any particular type of board that is more effective than the others or can you just buy one that is in the store at Walmart, you know, uh, that Hasbro makes and have success with it? Absolutely. Um, you, you can use anything you want. I, I, by the way, uh, and you probably remember this in my book, uh, I will pull out a paper sack, write the letters on it and numbers on it, goodbye, hello, yes, no, and I will turn a Pyrex cup upside down and I'll use that as a Ouija board. You don't need a Ouija board per se. Um, I just really like the one I showed you. I like mine because I've had it since I was eight. I've had it for many years <laughs> and I really enjoy using it. It's, just, it's, it's, it's easy. It's right there. I know people who make them on plastic that actually can roll up in a tube and they can travel with it and then pull it out and use like a, um, a disc from a box of old um, CDs. You can use that and that could be the planchette. You don't need the Ouija board or talking board to do this. But that's what people tend to gravitate towards. They think that's the only way you can communicate. There's no, there's no special hocus pocus magic on the board that makes them work. What makes them work is you and the other energy connecting, allowing that to blend, allowing it to match, and then allowing it to, to relax and open to you. So that, that's it. I, I, I could do it right now, like I said, without even a Ouija board. Now, a lot of people have had, you know, some bad experiences um, with um, Ouija boards. Would you say that it is because of the intent behind it? You know, the maybe even so much as the personality or energy that you are giving into the board that would have you experience a negative experience? That's, that's exactly right, Shannon. The energy we bring to anything in our life Let's just even step aside from the board right now. We, we, energy we bring into anything in our life is what we're going to get back. You know, if you, if you go through a negative attitude somewhere, you're going to tend to have people that are going to react more negatively towards you. Same thing with, with energy. That's how energy works. Same thing with your own frequency of your body. The, you know, the better you treat your body, the better your body's going to treat you back. It's like taking care of it, giving it rest, eating healthily, things like that, right? So the board's the same way. Um, you're dealing with energy. Not the board's not energy, you're dealing with your energy and what you're trying to communicate with. And so, therefore, the intent and my focus, um, me relaxing into myself, opening up, but also being centered, allowing myself to know how to um, do that. And I, and I know how to do it because I, I, I meditate a lot, I do a lot of other spiritual practices. 
that allow me when I come to the board to just keep it very centered and focused and positive. And then after a while, it's like riding a bike. It, yeah. just, it just works. It just works very easily. But yeah, you have to really watch your intent and your mind, your, your emotions. Um, it's, it's really a lot about feelings. It's more about emotions and feelings than anything. I can, I, I can think, but it's really more about my intentions and my feelings that I bring to the board. And, and I experimented with that over the years. And you know, there was one thing I do want to mention quickly in your book that I liked a lot. It was actually in your introduction when you were talking about the guides and you were talking about that we all have our own set of guides and, you know, they're just waiting there to listen to us, to, to hear from us, basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the thing that I like about that is I, I fully believe that, you know, I mean, whether it's the energy that we put out or, you know, our intent that we put out, putting out that idea or concept, you know, whether it's a guide hearing us or whether it's our own, you know, energy and will that are making it happen, you know, that vocalization of such thoughts and questions really does help someone. It does. It's like prayer. When you speak it out loud, it's like others congregate and help you. They, they've been proven how prayer, you know, people get together and pray about somebody it actually helps their health. It helps them healing. It's the power of prayer. So I say the, the power of, of your, of your thoughts, of your feelings, of your intent, of your whole countenance really will af affect um, what you get, what you get in life and what you get from the afterlife and as well as the interdimensional life. Um, these energies that are out there, it, we can't physically always see them all, although I, I can see them sometimes and, and I know a lot of people that can see them. It's just that, you know, it's a whole different vibration. But when we reach out to them and pray, or you know, like, like we, we might pray to God, or we 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 reach out and say, "Oh, I, I you know I need some help," that's when they can come to us. That is when any um, of these baby beings can come. The loved ones that have passed on. It's because there's a, your own volition. They're not going to cross that. There's a, there's a notion of free will, and call it a law, call it just respect. Um, I, I think it more it's about being respectful. They don't intervene unless you ask. Mm -hmm. The guides and guardians don't come through unless we ask. Our angels don't come through unless we ask. And I learned that as I ask, um, they come through. And when I'm on the board, maybe at a haunting, a home, a home, a place that's haunted, I will definitely will make sure I bring them in to help me. And I learned that. And that there's a story in my book that talks about that when I learned that lesson. It's important to have our helpers with this. And we're never alone. And this is what I've learned doing this work. We are never, ever alone. Even the darkest hour, when we think we are alone, or the, during the dark night of our soul, when something just so horrific happens in our life, we're not alone. We just got to be open, and they will let their presence be known. But what's really interesting that I've learned, and you, you probably know this too, Shannon, from the work you do with your paranormal group, is that the spirits will often come in smells, and they do poltergeist activities, you know, mm -hmm. but they do smells, they do um, scents, they will do come through songs on the radio. Um, they'll come through maybe a, a breeze. They do everything, anything and everything they can to let you know they're there. So there's like a reassurance. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, hey, pay attention to me. I'm here on a haunting, you know. Hey, I'm here. Um, so, that, you know, it's different ways. But, but, but yes, getting back to your question is we, we do need to reach out and be open. And that is when they come forth. And it's been my uh, personal experience as well um, that when you when as you are in the presence of spirit, your body reacts to that. Your body is a huge filler almost of you know spiritual energy, and you whether it's you know the hair standing up or the goosebumps or even just the feeling that somebody's watching you, your body it has this built-in equipment already as a filler and a sensor for you know what's the energy around you. Well said, very well said. It's a conduit, and it is a, our body is a conduit, and, it, and our body is really how we connect to anybody, everything, and anything. You know, I, I believe our heart is first. Our heart is really our first brain, and then and then our brain is next. And I think our heart is where the actually the doorway the, what opens us to the energy. And so, if you remember my book? There's a, some exercise I, I give people to do before they do the. The work on the board and i really recommend it with any spiritual work is that you want to bring in the energy ground yourself in your center and for women their center is in their hips for men it's in their it's up in their shoulders but you ground yourself into that center place and then from there you breathe back up in and through your heart and when you open your heart it's your conduit your channel 
It's like you are allowing love, positive energy to come through because it's your heart. And so that is where healings happen. It's where great communication happens. And as you begin to do this work, you don't need the board to do this work, as you know. It allows you to begin to really tap into and filter through such beautiful inquiries and and conversations and communications with beings, angels, guardians, guides, and you start to get images. I do. I get images. I get sensations. I will hear voices. I will hear things that actually help um, without the board because this inner body work that I'm doing. So that that's really well said, and it's something that people need to be more and more aware of. It's our body that does all this work. Our physical body is what allows it. And I would, so. I would agree with that 100%. I really did not know that a woman's center was in her hips, though. I just learned something new. Yeah. <laughs> our of, yes. Our center of gravity is in our hips, where a man's center of gravity is in his sh shoulders. Well, that, so that, that doesn't surprise me about men. Um, yeah. But the woman, the woman one does. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Okay. You know, and that's, so I'm writing this new book, and the new book is about this whole idea of where women's energy is and it's really in her hips and her hips is considered her sacrum it's her throne it's where she sits it's where she should love her hips and so that gets into the whole concept of this exercise of trying to put your energy back into your center it's like your don ten and they talk about and qigong it's that area right below your navel and all these different um and that's from the chinese uh background all these different cultures will talk about that and we know the chakras and you could put it into your root chakra, but that's where you connect back to the earth, to the ground. And so it's really important. It's important for men to also ground as well. But just the, uh, the concept of, of women really cherishing their hips and their sacrum and that part of their body where they do give birth, it, it's very empowering when you start putting your energy back down there. So that's, that's the next book. But um, I use those techniques um, and I talk about them in my books. And I learned the techniques, some of the work I did with my spirit guides through the Ouija board. I just, I, I'm totally, I, I'm still learning something. I learned something new. I'm, I'm astonished. <laughs> Which is a good thing. It's totally a good thing. Great. Um, so is there a proper way to use a Ouija board? I think there is. I mean, I don't have the only way by any means. But I, but yes, I think there's some there's a few guidelines you really, people, everybody should really pay attention to and take into account. And I'll just briefly cover a few of those. And I, I, I cover 13 of them. Uh, the magic number 13 in, in my book. But I, but the most important thing to start with is your intent, as we talked about. Prepare your body, prepare your emotions, prepare your mind, your thoughts, your intent. Prepare yourself. Be in a space of, that you feel good, that you feel happy, that you are excited, energetic, wanting to reach out and be open to allow communication to happen. And then I would say the next important thing is to set your space. And you set in your space means setting a space that's sacred for this session where you're going to be communicating, where you're saying, this is a serious th thing I'm doing. I'm going to let the spirits know I'm being serious about it. I'm going to light a candle. I might burn some incense. And then I'm going to say some type of prayer, some, some type of opening statement, some type of opening meditation. And I do that through breath. And then I verbally do that through a prayer I, I state. And, I, and that's in the book, too. I, I put all this in the book, so if anybody wants to know how to do this, it's on, in chapter four. You, too, can also Ouija <laughs> and to do it safely. And when I say safely, I don't think it's necessarily not safe. I just think you're going to get better encounters, great encounters, and you're going to find that you're going to deepen into some wisdom that you have within yourself if you, do, if you follow these practices. And this is not something I made up overnight. It's something I developed over the years. And then the last important thing to do, it's kind of two parts, is to always thank whatever, whoever, whomever came through, and then to also close the circle. I call it a circle because typically people come and gather when I do this, and we sit in a circle. Um, and I always see things in circles in terms of the energy spiraling in and spiraling out. And so I, I always make sure that I thank them, and then I also make sure I close it and put the board back, put the planchette back, step away from that sacred space, blow out the candle, and then go into the, the, my normal life. You know, it's like, it's like allowing yourself to step, step into a sacred, profane, um, uh, sacred spiritual space, and then to go back into the mundane, secular, go back into your life. So you kind of step into it, and then you step out of it. And that's kind of it in a nutshell, but I think those are the key elements that are important. 
And I do want to mention about the book real quick, um, which I am holding up, and it, pictures of it have been on your screen all night, as well as Karen's website, which I did want to mention. It has been up on your screen throughout the night. Um, mm. I love the format of the book. And I know that sounds silly, but so many books, and I told you this last night, but I have to just say it for everybody to know now. Um, but so many books, you have to... Like, you're like, okay, what part was that in? Like, I remember reading something, but I don't remember what part it's in. Or, you know, where, where, what was it that I read? And you have to, like, go through the whole book to figure it out. With your book, it is so set up. It's like a great little, it's a hand guide, too. <laughs> like, once you read the whole book, you can just go, oh, okay. Like, like when you said chapter four, I just instantly, like, turned to chapter four. And I knew, you know, exactly what you're talking about. And it was about the use of the Ouija board. You know, I mean, it's just... It's, I like, I like how your book's set up because it's really set up to be user friendly and so many books now are not that way because I'm the first person I read so much stuff and mm. somebody's going to be like, do you remember this? And I'm like, oh, so I have to go back and read, you know, and then you have to read through the whole book to find one little part, yeah. but your book is so not like that. You know, it's totally not, it's completely user friendly and I love the format. Well, thank you so much. That's a huge compliment I told you coming from you. I really appreciate that. Um, since you are very knowledgeable in this in, in this area of this, of this work, um, I wrote that way on purpose. My other book is written a little differently. I wrote this book that way as if I was sitting down and speaking to you as a friend, just as my spirits told me, just Karen, tell the story. No fluff, no big words, just tell the story. And the story to me was very sequential. And of course, I kept tedious notes. Uh, I have here's an example of one. Um, I keep notebooks like this. And I can show you kind of what the pages look like when I write. This is kind of how the writing looks. You can see it. It's um, mm -hmm. it's like this, and I have ways of coding. And I and I, you know, I'm writing at the same time. I got my hand on one on the planchette, and I'm like this. But I wrote it. I wrote the book in a way to match kind of the order of how things happened, as well as the progression of Ouija through the history and through my own life, because my life was like telling the history of myself. But I wanted everybody to to understand that this is just a to me, it was always the normal thing, although I had to hide in it, and also talk about that, the misconceptions and why I might have, under, I might have had to go underground with Ouija and when I decided to come out with it. But to put it in a format that you could reference through the table of contents and go, all right, now how do I do this book? Okay, so how, how, what, what's the difference between a ghost and an angel and an ethereal spirit? Okay, so animal communication, you know, I just thought what makes the most sense and to tell it in the most appropriate way as if I'm just sitting here with a friend. And so I would, I would, when I was writing, I wrote as if you're sitting there, Shannon, the readers, right here with me, we're just having a cup of coffee and having a nice little chat, <laughs> just like yeah. we're doing now. That's how I wrote it, and like that on purpose. So I'm so thrilled that it came across that way, and that's the response I'm getting from people, and, and that pleases me, because that, that, that's what I wanted to do. That's how I wanted to distill this information, which I find is valuable information, but in a way that could be user-friendly and to serve as a handbook. Mm -hmm. This this is important work to me, I, it, and I know you know that I take that seriously. That it needs that I wanted it in a format that people could read it and understand it in a, in a simplistic way, mm -hmm. too. Now let's um, talk about your journals for a moment. I know that you've been keeping journals since 1979. Is that right? Off the it, top of it was head? actually 89 when I really started writing everything down. But before that, there we go. I would write things down <laughs> in just private. I always journal in private, my own private journals. I could corroborate some of my stuff but mostly 89 i took this serious i have my journals i keep dates who spoke to me who was in the room what time we spoke where i was because I, I traveled with my ouija board <laughs> yeah. so that's important to me too um when you look back on these journals and you're reflecting on them do you find just 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 a curiosity question do you find that since you know from your younger years to now as you've progressed with the ouija that your messages and your um what's the word i'm looking for the messages and the intent that you are receiving has it changed and become more mm, maybe more higher serving or has it kind of just stayed the same well it, go, it vacillates back and forth i would say it's it's i've always gotten quite a quite a bit of messages on the board but but it depends uh okay there's a couple things here um before I go too further with your answer, I do want to say when I'm working the board with somebody new, it'll go through stages of it, we might just talk to dead people, might just get one or two let word, uh, words, 
Then after so many months of doing it with these people, um, who become my, the operators I work with, my partners in doing the board, it becomes paragraphs and pages. And that's because I think is the connection and the work we've been doing and, and how I also format and structure the session. And then of course I have a lot of guides and friends on the other side I speak with. So it makes it a little bit easier. But um, it, over the years, if there was a transition, and I do talk about in the book, as I started to learn who I was talking to and started to learn that I could use this, this board um, in a multitude of ways and, and speak to varying levels of consciousness, I, I realized I could use it for different purposes. One is to help people um, help find a sense of uh, release, a sense of, of, of safe haven um, after a loved one has passed on. Maybe they want to get a, some type of communication and they just want to know that their loved one's okay. So that's one level I'll use it. And that was probably how I used it in the beginning. Um, not, not probably, it was how I used it in the beginning, but it's how I still use it. I still use it today for those reasons. If somebody comes to my circle and really wants to speak to a loved one um, and they, they have, you know, they're hurting in their heart, it weighs heavy on them. So yeah, we'll use it for those purposes. But then I started realizing I could speak to many other consciousness. Um, and you may remember this in the book. I, I, I do speak to animals, uh, animals that are alive and animals that are dead. The weirdest thing was, and I didn't know you could do this. I mean, this is a, this is a trial and error. I mean, I'm learning as I go, and I'm still learning a lot about this tool um, and what we, we can actually communicate with uh, in the varying dimensions that we're surrounded by, different mm -hmm. frequencies. I'll, I'll say that. I was I was doing the board one time, and this was, I think it was 1996 or 94. It was 96? 96, I believe. And my angel, her name is Mary, and she came and said, Karen, you're not going to believe this, but somebody wants to talk to you. And all of a sudden, the, the, the feeling on the board changed. When I mean, I mean the planchette changed. It slowed down. And all of a sudden, it said, Hermes, cat, I love you. <laughs> My precious animal at the time. He was alive, sitting in a chair next to me, looking at me. Big, fat, orange cat. His name was Hermes. And he came through and spoke to me. And I went, what? You can speak to things that are alive? And that just changed everything. See? So it was always a progression. And when I learned that, oh, I started talking to all kinds of animals. I talked to my cats. All the time, and you, there's a session in the section in the book. Now I know that sounds far fetched, but when you start experimenting this yourself, you're going to be just quite amazed. Then I start speaking to our higher selves. I went through a period. Actually, that was before I spoke to the animal. That was a period of of 89 through about 92. We spoke to nothing but our higher selves, and meaning we purpose. It was more like talking to yourself, right? So therefore, you're doing kind of like an. Uh, Auto, auto, automatic way of talking with yourself. So it is like a telepathy or a magnetism. I, I don't care what it is, but I'm getting these great um, profound messages back that are coming from my higher self, blending with the people in the room's higher selves. You're getting this great kind of group think going on. And, and, and I'm just amazed at the messages I received. So as I began to experiment, talking to earthbound spirits or uh, ghost or, or deceased loved ones or ethereal beings or higher selves or animals, the list really goes on beyond that. I really started learning that you can use this tool to go in very many different directions. So it has been a progression. I would say I speak to all those different levels now, mm -hmm. all those different beings, still depending on what the circumstance calls for. Hmm. Now, I want to kind of focus on mainstream ideology for a moment um because the ouija gets a bad rap from most folks the mainstream idea is ouija's bad news how did it get that where did because when you talk about the history in the book you know it's something positive it's not like it's not bad it's something you know more towards the positive end of the spectrum and you know it then it goes now we're where we're at now and i'm just kind of curious how we got from a to b you know <laughs> right or a to z yeah, yeah. It, really, it, went, it went to a full swing 180 degrees the opposite direction is what happened you know you're right it was such a positive thing a tool it was a it was a game it was a parlor game it was it, people it, it was it was I was just neutral. It wasn't necessarily respected or disrespected. It just was. There was nothing, no weird connotations. Maybe people didn't use them. They didn't think, you know, thought, oh, it's just a toy. But there was no, oh, my God, you got a Ouija board in your house. You must be the devil, you know, I, which I get sometimes. But that's okay. Um, so what happened was 1973. 
And by the way, Shannon, the same year I got my little lovely board, I got it a day before this happened. In 1973, I think it was the day after Christmas, it was, um, The Exorcist came out. When The Exorcist came out, there was that little scene in the air where Reagan's using the board, or trying to use the board, and showing her mother that she uses the board and speaks to Captain Howdy. And in true luck, that girl was really a boy. But it, that's when it got its negative stance. And then Hollywood ran with that, and all these different movies we've seen. And then people started getting scared. And then, of course, um, you know, religions will get grab onto that and say, you shouldn't use it. Don't speak to false spirits or it's, it's, it's devils or demons. And, um, you know, that's, that's, has not been my experience, but that's when it fell from grace. You know, it was in its heyday, just people loved it. It was fun. And then all of a sudden it fell from grace. And we, and most of us have one in our closet somewhere, our attic, we put it away or we have to go, we think we have to go burn it to get rid of it or bury it or destroy it. It's, it's, it's nothing. It's just neutral. So I, I'm trying to dispel that myth by talking about it um, and trying to let people know it's just a neutral tool. And really, you don't need the Ouija board to do this. I do it without the Ouija board now, but I still en enjoy using the Ouija board because it's it's a tool I use that I've had quite success with it. But also, it's my tool. It's what it's what works for me. So, it, you know, it, it did. It still fall from grace. I think um, a lot of people that are you know in the paranormal industry now that are open just to, you know they're using the evps and the frank's box and all these different tools are open to sometimes using the board um and i meet a few of them more and more coming out of the, i think the closet as i did and coming out of the woodworks with it and, and being more open to tell me i too use a board you know i want to learn to use it better or we've used it for some some hauntings and you know stuff like that so i'm hearing a lot of people using it more and more mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily just the children it's people that are like my age yeah <laughs> Maybe because we grew up with it, maybe I don't know, but I think they're starting to see it as a viable tool um, at times. So it's, it's shifting again, but uh, um, Robert Murch has done wonders for uh, our, our friend the Ouija board um, because of all of his work he's done with, with the history of it, as well as his articles he writes and his website, too. So it, it's, it's changing, Shannon, it's changing little by little. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I've never actually used a Ouija board. And I don't know if I'd have any success in it whatsoever because I'm not one of these people that can chill out very easily. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, like you, the way you, the way you talked about in the book, like you got to like go into like this meditative kind of state and like chill out. Well, you, know, you, you did not, she did not say chill out in the book. This is Shannon. I say chill, no, yeah. This is, this is Shannon paraphrasing. All right. But, you know, you got to, like, chill out and, like, concentrate and just feel it. And I'm like, how in the hell do I do something like that? Like, because I'm always peeing off the wall. I'm a type A personality. <laughs> like, I, don't, I, couldn't, I couldn't even, like, begin to imagine, like, just sitting there and, like, because you really got to clear your mind and just let it go. And I, I have problems with that kind of stuff. I'm going to tell you. you. You know, and, and what's interesting, I'm typing. Uh, it's, it's apparent. Um, I, I am. And I... I have a lot of energy, and so for me to chill out too, as you said it, I would call it more centered. Um, and so I can do breathing. I'm so used to doing the breathing exercises and working with my body that that's really helped me. But um, I can do the board so quickly and have it working that I know if I did it with you, Shannon, it would be working. I, I, I know because I've worked with so many people with the board, and it always works. Now, will we get such profound and uh, messages and, and the lengthy messages I receive, like paragraphs and pages, maybe not, not in the beginning, but I know I, I can have anybody show anybody how to use it. It's, it's, it's more of setting the intent and the focus and all these other, other pieces I put in there that I, that they are important. It's so you have a sense of center about ourselves so we're not freaked out. <laughs> That's why those things are very important. We draw to us what, what we have within ourselves. And if we harbor something that's negative and scary and the fear, that's what we're going to draw towards ourselves. Again, that's just in life. That's just a, that's just like psychological theory. Mm -hmm. That's just like in, in, in when I was a therapist teaching people, you know, if you're always thinking negative things, you know, you might as well walk around with this scarlet letter on your forehead because that's what people are going to respond to you that way. You know, what you give out is kind of what you get kind of mm -hmm. principle. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but I, but I, I, I know you could do it. I know you could. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I kind of want to make a parallel here to paranormal investigators because so many people in mainstream say, you know, this is so bad, but here's the thing that 
gets me, and you know, this is one reason why I wanted to have you on. As paranormal investigators, we use tools for communication. We use, you know, EMF detectors, we use K2s, we use digital recorders, all kinds of things. So we're essentially doing the same thing as what you're doing with the Ouija board, except we're not using a board, we're using something different. Um, do you find that this is, you know, a, this is a good probability and likelihood of this realization uh, once people finally had this that you know Ouija will kind of start losing its bad vibe you know I don't know if it ever will and I, I and I say that and I think it's again what, what you guys are doing too it's it's allowing us to have more of a voice and use these different items technology or I'm using this old technology I'm old school you're new school yeah <laughs> but we're getting the same results you're right and I think What's, what happens is, is, is it, because of the way the board looks, I'll pull it up again. Here we go. Because of the way the board looks, I think it looks cool, and they're, they're really awesome pieces of artwork to me. Because of the way the board looks, it has kind of this ominous look to it, and I think that's what scares people. And, and it scares a lot of people. <clears throat> um, it, it goes against their religious values or their religious beliefs, and I think that's the reason why, why a lot of fear comes from uh, on the board. And so, it, it, and you are making com connection and the connection comes quite quickly and easily. As um, I know, you could be in the room with with these the boxes and and the detectors, and you may not get those. You, you may get some words. You may get some things you hear. This brings it in so much quicker. I think that scares people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, my my belief is that I don't think it's ever going to turn all the way around. I think it could get back to maybe um, on a better sitting a little better. <laughs> maybe people people just appreciating it. A little bit more but I, I don't know I don't think it's gonna turn around and it's okay if it doesn't turn around I mean <clears throat> this it does work very well and this is a tool that um, I think should be used with reference and um, with a sacredness to it and respect and and anytime you do any kind of channeling or opening up uh, going into the haunted house and the work you do you're opening yourself to <clears throat> you're putting yourself in a position to be at disposal of different energies and you so are. it always is good um, to have again some kind of centering positive you know respect to that and that's what I give the board and that's why it works for me and that's what you give your tools and when you go you, you know you're open for it it's like I know people that don't believe at all in ghosts uh, we'll just say ghosts or the spirits that they probably will never have an experience for those reasons they're very close to it and um, you really have to be open to begin to allow yourself to become in contact with this stuff and that scares people yeah and that will always scare people to have something of the unknown unseen to show i find it very um secure i find it very enlightening i find it reassuring that we're never alone and that our loved ones are always with us they're just in another dimension i find that but not everybody does that's scary to a lot of people and i, and I recognize that yeah, so, and, and it's a it lot. Of, it has a lot to do with religion too, because a lot of religions are like that's not um, that's not okay. Anytime you try to make any kind of contact with the spirit, that's you trying to like conjure up the devil, you know. And right. um, it, it's it, it, there's a lot of religious aspects within that too. Yes, absolutely. So, and I, I talk about that a little bit in the book, and and they, you know, everybody believes you should just only go through one source, Jesus, God. And for me, um, I really believe that they're all the same source. They're all connected. We're all from the same universal source. We're all from the God source. That they're all part of that light. And they teach me that. They tell me they're all part of the light, and they're all light workers. And even our dead loved ones become light workers on the other side to help us, to help us deal with our grief of their of them passing, and to let us know that it really death is not a scary thing, and that being on your side, your life it's not like life's over. Life continues. We were just doing a session. Um, I had an open message circle that I host at my home um, every now and then. And so I just had one a couple nights ago. And one friend came over who, who had just lost her father. And her father was nine years old, no less. But it was time for him to go. But she just, you know, she, you're never, you're never, you're always sad, no matter what. You're always sad. And just want to make sure that her father was okay. And he, and he can't come through right yet. He still, he just died a few weeks ago. Like, I think it's been four weeks and when they have, when they die with, with sometimes incredible issues and body problems, they heal on their side, but there's no pain. But he came back and he said, um, actually one of his relatives came forward, his mother, who's over there, who's helping the father heal, came forward and said, you know, I'm here taking care of him, and he's adjusting to his new life. They didn't say he's adjusting to death. 
It says adjusting to his new life over here, but yet he does miss you. So it's, it's a beautiful thing what they tell me. And it's not about death is death as we call it. It's life for them. There's a life force that continues on. And this is what I see is so helpful to use this type of tool because you experience that immediately with, with, the, with the board, with the talking board. It starts working right away. Um, still, again, intent, intent and focus and, and allowing, you know, harboring good thoughts brings good stuff forward that will come through. And so the conversations and the communication can be quite insightful, incredible, and quite healing. And, and that's why I do it. But yes, um, when, when you speak to all these different entities and spirits, religion doesn't, doesn't like that because they think you should only speak to one. Um, but I, I believe that they're all connected, and that's what they tell me. I mean, we're all part of the light. And we go back into that light, which is part of the bigger, greater God, light source, universal source, what you want to call it. We're all this part of a big matrix of energy. And that's why we can communicate with them when they go beyond. We're, we're no different from their energy. We just connect again and we, we have conversations. So uh, it's a very healing thing, actually. I, and I wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't healing for myself and for people. And like I said, I've been doing this for over 40 years, almost 41 years now. And it's been very helpful, actually, very beneficial. Hmm. Now, I do want to, you, just to clarify, you did say that you go into, like, you use the Ouija board in, like, haunted locations, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so, just an idea. I would be interested, <laughs> because I'm this kind of person. Um, right. I would be interested in a location, you going in there, doing your thing, having your results, and then on a separate time, a paranormal team goes in there with their Love equipment, it. they get their results, and then you combine and exchange and compare your results just to see how the Ouija was compared to what the paranormal investigators did. I love it. I welcome that. I love that, and I welcome it. I think it's a great idea. Um, I've been given a lot of um, ideas, and I've been, and I'll been, write this down after our show, about, about this and how to check the Ouija board. And I mean, nothing's ever 100% accurate, but yeah. I would love that because I do have such great success on the board to get names, to get who's here, um, to find out dates, um, words, whatever it is, what's going on in this space without knowing anything about the space. And yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, I love that. If, if somebody wants to approach me with that, I would be happy to do that. And, and I have some things that I'm working on right now that might give me an opportunity to do this. So I've been reaching out to a lot of people. A lot of people have been reaching out to me because of uh, the book, actually. And so I love that, Shannon. A sh yes. shame that you're in California because if, if you were in Georgia, we could make that stuff happen like that. <laughs> well, if I ever come out that way, I'll let you know because yeah. it, we will do it. We will do it. Um, I do want to take just a moment for you to mention um, and to talk about, you know, briefly your new book, kind of your plans for the future and your new book and when that's expected to come out and that kind of thing. Yeah, okay, so um, everything, by the way, we're talking about, you can find it all on my website, KarenAdalman.com, and also the, the new book is really about some of the work I've done uh, with myself, with friends, with people, with especially with women, healing a work I've done with them through some of the board stuff, when I say board, the Ouija board, um, learning about um, the energy of the queen, and I say that it's not like queen, like diva. It's about really owning that sacred space within yourself, your throne, the throne of your body, which is your hips, and really learning to own that space, center in that space. And that is where a lot of the older cultures believe life starts. And of course, life starts there with birth, right? Yeah. But to really go back into that space and learn to become whole within ourselves w internally with the sacred marriage of the king and queen. This new book will get into a sacred geometry, more into uh, alchemy, alchemy throughout the ages, big time into alchemy as I talk about the alchemical process we women go through as we start to transform our lives. A lot of it's based on my work, working with women in therapy and the work I've done with women with their bodies, uh, body issues, as well as just self-esteem. And then it also works with the board. And I, I like to call it Leisha therapy sometimes because it's, it's so therapeutic. It's been so helpful. And the concept of this whole book came, came out of that, my Ouija board sessions. And I'm going to be very personal about some of the, the healing I've gone through with the work on the board. So that's my that's my new book. There will probably be a part two to Ouija. I'm getting a lot of questions about um, this last book, The Spirits of Ouija, because there are there is more. This is Ouija 101. There really is a Ouija graduate level Ouija, mm -hmm. and I, and it's it was there the whole time. I just didn't want to scare people with all that um, and open up too much. 
But when the time comes, I'm going to share a lot more, and that'll probably be another book as well, part two. I've got some other ideas for books too. Um, because of my animal communication, I have an idea to write about a book, a children's book. It won't won't be about Ouija, but it'll be about um, an animal story that'll be very enlightening and and, and warm for children to read, um, related to some of the communication I've had with animals. Well, so that's what's going on for me. I am super excited when your book about yeah. you know woman's energy being centered in her hips come out. You give me a holler because I want to have you back on, and we're gonna Thank go you. through that book because I'm Thank excited. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited to I will. I'll give you a holler for sure. Um, I want to say thank you so much to Karen for being on tonight and expanding our minds with Ouija and um, challenging us to believe things that are outside of mainstream society. And I appreciate that. Thank you, Shannon, so much. It's been a joy being on your show. And thank you to all your listeners. And I really appreciate it. Next week on Paranormal Minds, we will have on Ken Gerhard. He will be talking about humanoids with wings. So we mm -hmm. will talk with him next week. Once again, Karen, thank you so much for being on. And her website's up on your screen. Write it down really quick. Spirits of the Ouija. Great book. Check it out. All right, guys. I will see you next week. Same time, same place. Come around. See you later. Bye, guys.